on the sheer arbitrary premise that five minutes is as good a time to wait as any, I would like to begin. I'm going to sit through this because it seems to me proper not to stand when Monsignor, Al <laughs> Monsignor Albacetti is sitting. My name is Bob Pollack. I am a biology professor at Columbia, and I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Science and Religion. Um, we have a public seminar series, and this is a talk in that series. All of that is probably familiar to most of you. Uh, I, I don't know, but that perhaps Monsignor Albacetti is familiar as well. But I'm going to make my introduction anyway. I have a copy of his book, God at the Ritz. I see he's brought a copy of his book. Okay. It's a significant book, as he is a significant man. And he is a representative of what the book is about, in that he is, uh, well, as it says here, he's a a man who exemplifies his faith by his actions. So I will read from the flap something about him. He is a physicist by training. He holds a degree in space science and applied physics, as well as a master's degree in sacred theology from the Catholic University of America in Washington. He holds a doctorate in sacred theology from the Pontifical University of St. Thomas in Rome. He is taught at the John Paul II Institute in Washington and at St. Joseph Seminary in Yonkers. And from 1996 to 97 served as the president for his sins, the president of the Catholic University of Puerto Rico in Ponce. He's a columnist for the Italian weekly Tempe and has written for the New Yorker and has been advisor on Hispanic affairs to the U.S. National Council of Catholic Bishops. He's a friend of mine. He's a friend of the CSSRs. He is the spiritual leader of the American part of the international movement Communion and Liberation, which has been uh, a, a, a gift to myself and my family in our meeting of his colleagues. And before I turn over the microphone and sit back and listen to him, I will read to you one paragraph from his book, which to me, and I hope to you, will serve as more than an introduction, a placement of us all in one space. Quote, the face of the other, in all its vulnerability, calls for a response on my part that determines my personal identity. This is my identity, and this is prior to all conceptualization or designed response on my part. It takes each one of us to that beginning of wonder and awe that precedes all thought, all intentionality, all purpose and design. It is the basis for an ethical behavior that is not based on ideas, concepts, and external laws. It is the manifestation of a sacredness that is not divisive nor destructive. Through it, I become the one totally responsible for the other. I think that is a good way to live. It's a pleasure to introduce a man who does, Monsignor Albacetti. Actually, it sounded pretty good. <laughs> I almost copied it. Which, um, all right. My, uh, my mother's last words to me before she entered the twilight zone of 11 years with Alzheimer's were, you have lost all shame. And uh, once again, this is proved by my presence here. I read the other people who have participated in the seminar, the names, the topics, and then it's awesome. I can't even begin to, to imagine myself at such a level in, in such a company. I, 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 don't, I should have, in all honesty, said no. But I have lost all shame. And uh, it's an opportunity, not just a gig, but something I could, I love doing, the discussions on, on these topics that we will tonight. Uh, anything for my friend Bob Pollack, whom, uh, if you were to read the book, he plays a crucial part. It helped me out, think through many of these questions. And uh, so it's, a, it's a, a nice way to spend an hour, an hour and a half with a free meal afterwards. What else can one ask for? When I came to New York the first time, 10, 11 years ago, 
Cardinal O'Connor, then gloriously reigning, gave me three assignments. Number one uh, was to teach at the seminary. And I said, what, uh, what do you need a teacher of? And he said, oh, the world. You must, uh, you, I have chosen you for that because of your worldliness. And I said, oh dear, well, uh, I suppose that's a compliment, but, but I kind of recognize myself in it. I know I would never be chosen because of my spirituality. So here we go. By the way, after he died, I was thrown out of the seminary. Now, the second reason had to do with the Hispanics and my work. My first, my identity as a Puerto Rican, that's where I'm from, and, uh, and my work with the Hispanics, uh, with the Bishop's Conference, and in, in my own personal experience, even to this day, I am involved with the Hispanic parish on the Lower East Side. And the third was phrased like this, already semi-insulting me with my worldliness. The third one, he said, now the third is this, he said, because of your abysmal lack of moral <laughs> certitude, I think you may be the person indicated to infiltrate the media, the academic world, uh, etc., to see if there is an openness to establish a dialogue with the church on, uh, we could create an office of faith and culture, he said, and uh, get a little money, have some money for it, and then we would uh, be able to have dialogues, conversation. You could head that office, I'd give you a decent title. Uh, well, again, I would say my insulted uh, because of my immorality, but I thought it was an exciting possibility, and I began to, to infiltrate. Within uh, two things happened, very important to me. Within a couple of uh, months, I had already been asked to write what turned out to be the cover article for the New Yorker magazine uh, on the visit of uh, po um, yes, Pope John Paul II to Fidel Castro. And uh, I went, uh, eventually got the okay. I mean, they liked it, both sides, directly from the Pope and directly from Fidel Castro. How I managed all of that, I suppose, is my abysmal lack of principles anyway. <laughs> and, but second, I met this lady, her name is Helen Whitney, and she is an award-winning, including Emmys, uh, documentary writer, producer, etc. She has her own company, and she does work for whoever hires her. Most of the time, and most recently, she's been doing for PBS, and in particular, Frontline, which comes out of the PBS station in Boston, WGBH. And at that time, she had interested them and gotten hired to put together a Frontline show, which eventually was two hours, on the cultural impact of the teachings of Pope John Paul II. The show was not on John Paul II. It was on how he was received by people prominent in, the, in those areas that constitute the particular dominant culture, I guess, if I could put it that way. In the science, for example, uh, the great questions of, of the day uh, that he was involved with, uh, uh, all of that, politics, uh, question of war, peace, uh, economics, the poor, etc. How did the people out there, the real worldly people, how did they, uh, they react to what this man was proposing? A man that was so interesting in that from one point of view, he was the most modern, so to speak, of all popes, yet he had never even gone to an official seminary, had been an actor, a poet, a dramatist, uh, completely at ease in the world with women, kids, whatever, and yet, had uh, under as Pope seems to be uh, unleashed with the most uh, um, devastating critique of contemporary culture, uh, speaking even of the of a culture of death, etc. What was going on? What uh, did he change his views or or etc. So that was what the documentary wanted to explore by interviewing. Let me see. Eventually, 
over 700, almost 800 people were interviewed. And there was enough money to take the cameras uh, abroad even to do interviews around the world on, uh, on, on that question. So uh, Helen uh, Whitney attended a, a lunch that a friend of mine had put together inviting some of the people I, I was supposed to infiltrate. And she asked for my help in doing this documentary. I understood my task was first to make sure that she had been fair in presenting the views of the Pope, help him get names of people who could present other sides of, uh, of what was being said by one side, and that it was fair. Towards the end, I ended up uh, speaking on behalf of the Pope myself in a shameless manner since I had no authorization whatsoever, maybe everything. That's what I was concerned after he saw the show. He might say, you've completely misrepresented my views. But anyway, being shameless, I plunged ahead. It was a chance for a two-hour TV gig. Anyway, so we did that, and, uh, and that was done. And uh, part of the process of getting these things out is the fall presentation, your fall programming. Towards the end of the summer, the networks and such people uh, select samples of the new programming or of the new content to old programs that they intend to show in the fall. And they invite all the media people who write about television and programs and reviews, etc., like that, to a Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Pasadena, California, with wine and dance and everything you want. Uh, you just sit there and watch the show they present you, and you can ask questions. The idea is that you are impressed. Uh, or favorably impressed by, by the drinking, if not by the quality of the show, and that you would write good stuff. After all, these shows may be shown only once, so there, a bad review can really hurt. In any case, uh, I, I was invited by the frontline people to join the group that would present this. I, of course, in a gesture of a complete uh, obedience and only out of humility, I accepted. And I had to accept being driven around L.A. in limousines and a jacuzzi in my room, which I immediately thought in terms of a baptismal fountain. Anyway, we had a great time. And at the presentation, uh, which was something like this, a, a stage and then the people who came with us uh, were there. At the presentation, uh, the first question was, why another show about Pope John Paul II? And uh, Helen, she's a genius in, on, behind the camera. She collapses in front of it. So she didn't really know what to say and said, Monsignor will answer this. So I said, well, look, look this is not a show about uh, another show about Pope John Paul II. I mean, such a thing would be abysmally boring. Two hours of that again. This is a show about you, to all you people, about your reaction to John Paul II and people like you. Well, whatever I said, 95% of the rest of the questions were directed at me, and they had nothing to do with the show or the program but essentially about the possibility of religious belief in the world today. If I could phrase the question is, can one be truly worldly today and still adhere to some kind of religious belief in the what, in the beyond, in transcendence, the infinite, the unknowable, the mystery, whatever the heck you call it. Or, or, or must you, in order to be faithful to modern life as it is lived and understood today, must you uh, give up uh, that kind of uh, earlier, more primitive way of thinking? That was the question that kept coming back again and again in different topics. In the topics of science, for example, in the topics of what we know about human suffering and the magnitude of it today. In, the, in, in terms of politics, etc., and the uh, the dominant uh, view—that's uh, to say, the the side of religious belief had to prove itself, not the the side that it was uh, where it was absent. That was the assumed. 
And if you made a claim, a contrary claim, uh, then you had to prove that claim. Uh, there had been uh, already a, a persistent and, and in many places very effective, at least in terms of, uh, of dominant cultures, critique of religion uh, that uh, had essentially relegated it to something of the past uh, that you can hang on to in a, in a private way, but uh, with no, no claim to any kind of public attention. That was before 2001. In any case, uh, I attempted to answer all those questions. They went beyond the presentation, uh, and we continued such discussions at the bars of the Ritz-Carlton and the pool side, etc. It was wonderful, but any, but I didn't. I wasn't thinking I would be there all the time representing God, <laughs> you know. Uh, but what the heck? Uh, that was what uh, they wanted, and they are paying. So I tried to answer all their questions. Until somebody uh, said to me, why don't you put down in book form? And I said, all right. I mean, when I came back to New York, I thought it would be nice to organize my thoughts quickly and then maybe offer the answers that I, uh, with greater precision or detail that I had attempted to offer during the actual questioning in which I was considered the representative, the ambassador of God at the Ritz. And that's why it is called God at the Ritz. And this is the book. It's, uh, it was a few years old, but it's kind of making a comeback in its pocketbook edition. And in preparation for this and uh, my conversations with Bob, I've had to reread it, found myself underlining it. So I think it's still interesting. And uh, so here we go. And it brought me here, and this is fun. I, I want to say this. Remember, it was written at a time in which the religious factor, let's call it the religious sense, the religious experience, a religious way of looking at reality, was considered something already overcome as a factor in the constitution of today's world, in, in, in what really matters, relegated to something else, if at all accepted, to something unimportant. That uh, originally was, therefore, uh, much of the questioning came, uh, assumed this assume, as I say, that this was a, a religious thinking belonged to a surpassed, more infantile level of the evolution of human thinking. That, of course, has radically changed. And what made it change, unfortunately, was September 11, in which uh, the religious sense, and, and I maintain this, and I have discussed it and debated it, and in fact, written about it, and in fact on another television uh, uh, show for Helen called uh, On the Spiritual Aftermath of 9-11, which was another PBS uh, frontline presentation, in which I, I argue that from the, as I, and I have to be honestly, as uh, within seconds of hearing what was happening in 9-11, I was here in New York, I immediately, uh, I said, my God, this, this has a religious motif to it. And, uh, and, and that's what I still maintain. Uh, that, that dimension uh, is important. And so now, as for spending some time arguing for the, the fact that it may be of social use to be less closed to what the religious thought can offer about life, now suddenly I just wanted to, to withdraw and, and said, what the heck, uh, those who were trying to eliminate religion from public life were correct. I mean, I, I experienced that immediately. In any case, the book God at the Ritz begins with a question about the persistence of the religious sense when it should have disappeared, uh, according to that way of thinking. 
it seems that when you have done all you can and you have a great achievement in having finally uh, excluded uh, any significant meaning to religious claims from, from what really matters in your life, it seems that something little happens and the whole damn thing crumbles and the questions again about meaning and purpose and why and where am I coming from, where am I going from, uh, spontaneously appear uh, after like breaking through uh, years of being blocked off. Suddenly they, they rise. I find that uh, experience, uh, I find uh, found it a little bit in myself, but I find it in many people. Uh, uh, I, what is, I'm trying to think of the name of the book by Ian McEwan about the great neurosurgeon. What is his name? What is the book name? Do you remember? What? Saturday. Saturday. Splendid. Absolutely splendid. I think one of the greatest books of all times. Because there you see someone totally secularized and uh, who nonetheless lives moment in which the question tends to surface. And, uh, and, it is, and it is good to see how he succeeds in, in, in not letting it become the determinant one, but uh, it comes back. I mean, why, why is this the persistence of, of that question? Why does it, uh, uh, does it keep coming back? Maybe, you know, a good, an explanation, if you read some of the people there, that I, as I mentioned in the book, some of the answers, it has to do with aging. <laughs> After you arrive at a certain age in which your disappearance is less theoretical <laughs> and more possible, you know, when, when, you no longer, when you know very well that if your obituary appeared in the Times tomorrow, no one will be surprised. No one will say, oh, how unfair is life, eh, what the heck? Then you begin to, the question begins to say, well, uh, what am I going to do about this? That kind of thing. Maybe that's it. But then it keeps popping up, not just in aging people, but also in young people, in moments of plus, of, 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 of great happiness, and in moments of, of tragedy. It just will not go away. So the first part of the book examines uh, that phenomenon and deals with the famous uh, masters of suspicions. These are Feuerbach, uh, no, I'm sorry, these are Freud and Nietzsche, and, uh, and who was the third? Yeah, Marx. Good heavens, how to have forgotten Marx, this is a scene. Uh, Marx, uh, Freud, and Nietzsche, which were interpreters of the religious sense, and uh, and saw it as a manifestation of, of something deeper and offered a method by which one could uh, finally confront what was really the question that was moving us and, and expose the, the religious way as perhaps at one time valid but now no longer necessary way of looking. The religious experiences, uh, religious language, were held a suspect. They are indications of something else, something truer. This method of suspicion continued for a, even when each one of these three developed uh, neo schools, you know, neo Freudians, neo etc., and uh, neo Marxism, and went on and on, neoing all over the place. But even after they, the method is the same. The idea is not to trust a religious insight or religious experience and look instead for an, an explanation of what really is causing it that is completely outside any thought of a possible transcendence or eternal life or, or any such thing, any questions of meaning and purpose, etc. The, the method, the methodology of suspicion, in my opinion, has not uh, ceased even now even though, again, uh, uh, the particular, those three may have I mean, evolved into something else. In fact, in so many ways, the methodology of suspicion shows itself in modern science, as I understand a lot. That ties to reduce your really religious claims to essentially a, a, a phenomenon totally explained 
in terms of, uh, of scientific reasons and method, etc. It's, it is a, I propose, however, that all of these, uh, all of these uh, proposals, all of this uh, uh, suspicion method is, uh, involves, if you look at it, a, in order for it to work, a reduction, I think, of the scope of the questions. It, uh, it blocks, certain questions are not permitted. Uh, certain experiences are marginalized. Uh, the, the question of why, for example, of meaning and purpose, the religious question, presumably it is launched uh, and it won't stop until it finds something. And it tries to understand, well, you ask the question why, you say, well, why not? I mean, why, upon what base? That's to say, it tries to measure the significance, the meaning of a moment within a totality. This is what I say. It is this totality that keeps changing, this horizon. Uh, in, in using the terminology of Professor Pollack, the horizon between, uh, there is the, the known, the unknown, and then the horizon with the unknowable. It is uh, the, the, the question of why or meaning always wants to break and to continue going beyond the horizon of known and unknown into the unknowable. And it is the, the method uh, of suspicion and doesn't allow that, wants to say you must end here. There is no way you can even talk about the unknowable. Uh, and that's fine. That is, uh, my concern with that is that I then try to practice it myself. After all, this is an important point I repeat there again and again. Listen, in the end, it's you. I remember asking, one, a friend of mine asked one class at the university someday uh, to identify the people who identify themselves as atheists. And uh, many, the vast majority, of course, raise their hands. And then you would ask each one, why are you, why are you, why are you? Not a single person gave himself or herself as a reason. Like, I, am, I have been unable to confirm re or religious claims, to verify them, or I, I, I do not, uh, my experiences are totally explainable without introducing the possibility of transcendence or infinity or the mystery. No. Everybody gave a reference. I read so-and-so, I adhere to so-and-so, so-and-so has shown, etc. Uh, you know, in something like this, I think we should, each one, uh, have our own position, our own verification, and period. Because it's, uh, I mean, this borders on the ultimate question, what is the meaning of my life? And, uh, and I think we should be able to confirm, uh, verify, and defend whatever position we, uh, we embrace in that, uh, especially when the proponents of the method of suspicion were not just simply theoreticians, but they are what uh, Walker Percy calls lovers of humanity. He says, you could be a theoretician of humanity, Marxist, a Freudian, a biologist, uh, a theoretician of humanity, and actually make very important discoveries that represent a big contribution to life. And indeed, that is the case. In all the areas where one finds a method of suspicion, this has happened, certainly in science, for example. And the contributions it has made are, are beyond challenge, and that's fine. On the other hand, you could be a lover of mankind, that is to say, in which you are there assisting, project, developing projects that change the quality of human life. Again, you can be an activist in that sense and accomplish many things uh, that end up benefiting uh, humankind. But if you are both a theoretician and mankind, says Walker Percy, and a lover of mankind, you are very dangerous very, very dangerous, because in the name of the goodness of the, or of the truth of your theory about mankind, you will implement this, you will change things that may be, in fact, 
destructive, completely destructible. So, uh, how to deal uh, with this is, uh, is found in, uh, in the first part of the book about lover of humanity, etc., the dangers, why it is important to consider it this way. All right, one can issue all kinds uh, of warnings about it. One can say, I see your point, you have a valid question, well, but what do I do about it? How do I go about confirming the, uh, should we say, the, um, I don't want to say, you know, I, I want to say the truth of religious claims, but maybe that sounds too much for you, uh, the possible truth of religious claim. You know, how does one go about this? In, uh, this is a fascinating discussion, and today it is a very popular discussion all over the place. Uh, most recently, I had the uh, beautiful experience of what was supposed to be a debate with Christopher Hitchkins on this matter at the Hotel Pierre. Again, this is associated with free meals, which you see are, in fact, what moves me most of the time. And then when I, there he was. Uh, man, I understand most defenders of the faith will not go on the stage with him because they have been killed uh, by him, and he's a, an attractive uh, argumenter. And British, what the heck, this is a British guy versus a Puerto Rican. Uh, there's no chance, there's no chance that I may make a point. But anyway, and, but there he was. And as a matter of fact, actually, if I make a little mental, uh, build a little block between part of what I have experienced, just separated, in most of the other ways of thinking, I agreed with him. So. I kept saying that, and he was very upset. And at one point said, I've been deceived. I thought I was coming to debate this with a man of faith. You know, people tend to insult me like this. <laughs> this is now not from Cardinal O'Connor, but this is now from, uh, from Mr. Hitchkins, <laughs> the, the cardinal of contemporary atheism. Uh, anyway, uh, because I insist, you know, who, who, you need to be convinced that this is at least a, a passable, uh, a worthwhile way in that, that it is a, it doesn't offend human dignity to, to think this through, to try to consider the possibility of the truth of religious claims, but to ask for verification. Uh, if you do not ask for verification, I, I don't see how you can hold on to anything. I mean, you have what would be, in the case of faith, a blind faith. One man present in the discussion with Hitchkins said, uh, defending the side of faith, was arguing that there is no evidence. Faith is when you adhere to things without evidence. Well, I, I almost fell off the chair. I, I said, I mean, my God, I, I cannot possibly imagine how you would accept anything like this without evidence. I mean, grant you, the evidence that pertains to faith is going to be different from the evidence that pertains to science, say. But in the end, it's evidence. It is a fruit of reason. We have no other mean, no other mean of grasping anything about reality and about us but reason. Faith, I believe, is a way of knowledge of reality, but it is a way of knowledge that is reasonable. And, and you can see this when faith doesn't apply to the mystery or the beyond, but applies to everyday life. I mean, you, you demand to see the flying license of your pilots in the airplane, uh, you're crazy. I once, uh, <laughs> just to, to confirm this, asked the lady how she could possibly sleep in the same bed with her husband. Uh, uh, for 20 years or so, because I thought he looked like me, he looked to me like I've seen many of these shows, like a serial killer. And, and, and I was staying that night at their house, and I was terrified. I didn't sleep at all. I couldn't lock the door or anything, 
but I was convinced he was going to come out with a hatchet, that something happened at work, and the next day they'll find us in pieces with the two Labrador dogs. It was just like awful. And I finally, I was so relieved when I got up that uh, during breakfast I asked her, he had gone back to the office, Mrs. X, you know, how come you don't mind like losing consciousness next to your husband? I mean, I don't, I, obviously you sleep with your husband, I understand, you're his wife. But beyond that, when that part is over, when you're overcome by, by sleeping, shouldn't you just go up and lock yourself up in a room in case he had a bad day at the office? And it works the other way around. She could be the serial killer. I was joking, but maybe not. And she just stared at me and said, you know, if you really think this way, Father, I am very sorry for you. I mean, you're crazy. He is my husband, 20 years. I said, yeah, well, you know, it could be 21 that breaks. Uh, you can maintain this or you can have faith in him. Again, is it reasonable or isn't it? If it is reasonable, then you can say, I know my husband, it's knowledge. If it isn't, <laughs> you better watch out. Get yourself a lock. Anyway, for that reason, uh, for that reason, because of that, I want to know, is there a way, a reasonable way, a reasonable method by which I can verify the, the claims or of, the, of the religious experience, of a religious contribution, if I'm trying to find the minimalist language possible, religious contribution to the way I see life and live it. And, and I, I believe that there better be, because if there isn't, then I am completely uninterested in the subject. How does one, uh, how might one do that? What we really have to do, I believe, and in this I am entirely dependent to a man, the founder of the movement that I follow and that I'm more or less, I don't know what the heck I really am concerning the movement in the United States, is a book called The Religious Sense by Father Luigi Giussani. In so many ways, God at the Ritz is the total vulgarization of the religious sense. If you want a more serious, more uh, presentation of what is here, which quotes uh, Monty Python and everybody and Broadway shows, because I don't know Italian poets. Here is you know, Dante, and that's the kind of it's amazing, good stuff, real key, all of that material. But here, in my book, I try to bring it down to my humble level. The question is, there is me, and there is reality out there. What we need to investigate, I believe, and this is very important because a discussion about this is already a dialogue between people of faith and people who do not have faith, but both who are willing to submit to a reasonable analysis and evidence, something claimed to be evidence. What is claimed to be evidence here, what I think we should all look at, is our spontaneous reaction to reality. Better, to investigate the structure at all levels, the structure of the human reaction to reality. The unleashing, unleashing of the question about why, and not only why, but what next, what next, the unleashing of reason itself ground zero, and to observe oneself when that happens. Most of the time, we have lost the purity of such a moment, but it's there, it's there. I remember and mentioned in my book a cartoon in The New Yorker in which this lady and her husband, very, very type New Yorker cartoon, New York resident people, are bringing the little baby out of the hospital, newborn, well, I mean, uh, born a few days, going back home in any case, and the taxis and the buildings and the canyons of Manhattan, everything are there. 
and then and the little baby is there, and, and then the lady says, Harry, look, Harry, the world. <laughs> I, that had this great impact on me. Suppose, suppose Harry could see or think or anything. What would have been his initial reaction when the world impacted him? His initial, zero, before anything starts. And uh, Monsignor Giussani in his book talks about a, a mental experiment. Uh, suppose you could go back into the womb and come out having, however, your awareness, your, the way you, your consciousness of yourself that you have now, but not having had the experience of anything else but you. What would be your first reaction? Now this is, again, you make a claim and the other person say, no, I don't think so, etc. Uh, uh, to me, I am satisfied because again, I could, I could uh, confirm it by even looking at that cartoon that the immediate reaction is surprise. Oh, marvel, wonder, oh, look, Harry, the world. She herself was communicating that experience to Harry. Again, Harry had no idea what was going on. But had he been able to see, he would have marveled, wonder, stupor. All of these are words that, that resonate in what I'm trying to, to explain. I have them here. Stupefaction, to be overcome by wonder, to be invaded by wonder, to grasp. Reality as an event, and it's, it's not just there, it's, it, it, it has touched you, it, it has attempted to initiate, or, or you want to initiate a dialogue with it, an event, a presence, a marvel, something totally given to you. You are not, one thing is clear, you are not the author of that. Whatever that is and whatever it's coming from before you begin classifying it or doing anything, you are not its author. So it's, uh, you, you, you run into it. So uh, uh, the, the original activity, if you wish, is in fact a form of passivity. It's a, a receiving, a taking note of, a recognizing. It is to become aware of an inexorable presence that attracts, but which is always beyond and always other, 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 the radical otherness of it. But yet, it is a radical otherness that attracts, that is tempting me, like it's seducing me, you see. And that launches one. The important thing is not to stop, to continue pursuing that experience, to see where it goes in the book and in the religious sense, this is done. I mean, I propose a path that one follows, but today I want to underline the importance of that point of departure. If we do not appreciate or agree with that that is the point of departure, before the, and, and, and Bob just quoted that from my book, before, in a sense, thought takes over and classification and so that, which it has to, but before it does, if that is not the point of departure, then uh, we might as well stop. In my opinion, it will lead to nowhere. And, uh, and, and indeed, religious claims and the faith that follows them will be completely useless and, in fact, dangerous. I'm willing to stay, bet everything, on that point of departure. So, there you are. If that is the point of departure, then to conclude the analysis, at the conclusion of it, I would have come to see reality as a sign. It is a sign is something that always points elsewhere. I see it, I come into contact with it, and I, it points elsewhere. And I am to travel that path, that experience of sign, to see where it points and where it goes. Beyond that, nothing can be said. What you find, what you do not find, 
doesn't interest me, not at this level. I am interested only in, in whether the path is reasonable and human. Having set this up then, I begin the various areas where this is to be, if you wish, applied. Again, I did not choose these areas. These came up in the actual questioning that I experienced at the Ritz-Carlton, hoping to recreate in my own room the experience of the Ritz-Carlton and failed miserably. Actually, I went back to do the other show. The, they invited me back to do the 9-11 the show. It was amazing. But I haven't been in a long time. My next book is going to be God at the Motel 6, <laughs> which more reflects the quality of my presentation. <laughs> the one uh, and first area to which this was applied, or is applied in the book, is the question of science. Ta -da, ta -da. Why, again, because they asked it. There were no, to my knowledge, no scientists there. These are people who th think science dictates, uh, you know, that they reject every possibility of the reasonableness of a religious claim or belief. So they wanted to know how come I didn't. I say in the book that I've always I've been asked two questions, that the asking of these two questions is, convinces me of the unity between mankind, because I've been asked them everywhere. One of them is that one. How come you can be a scientist and a person of faith? And the other one is, how come you don't look Puerto Rican? <laughs> well, that one is not difficult to answer. The second one is the rest of the book. Uh, anyway, this has been a question in my own life, and it means and it meant a lot to me. I guess I, as Professor Pollock said, I dabbled in physics. Uh, right now, I would have to go back to kindergarten, obviously. I haven't done the research in a long time, but I still keep the joy and spirit of, uh, of it. I mean, the adventure, reading books of the history of physics and, and uh, journals uh, explaining what's going on in areas that I had been involved with. It's always exciting and I have a great uh, great love and admiration for that. And however, I saw no conflict. I, I was a Catholic and uh, I was a Puerto Rican Catholic, Latin American Catholic. I mean, well, that's, there's nothing else. Uh, even Protestants are Catholic there. Uh, Non-believers are Catholics, cats, dogs. If you move, you're a Catholic. What the heck, it's Latin America, you said. So I didn't see any kind of a conflict at all. But the people at the lab did. Oh, I hope they didn't see it in me, but they, they, wanted, they were puzzled. And I could, when they asked me the question, I could immediately feel not only the puzzlement, but began to affect me. And that is, you come in here Monday through Friday, sometimes even Saturday, and you are a man entirely in love with and guided by your passion for science, your respect for the method, your learning from your peers, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and it is fine, and, and you do great, and we're so happy you've joined our team, and et cetera. But then you go out here on the weekends, and on Sunday it turns out you're someone who believes that a dead man is no longer dead. How can you be two people? I mean, which, who is the real you? I was asked. And you know, I had really never thought of it. And so I began to, to see how I could answer. Because uh, I, I acknowledged their right to ask that question. Because I felt that question in me after they asked it. And I began the process that in many ways has brought me here today. So this question, in a sense, the question about science and faith or religion has been absolutely a determinant in my life. So the book tells you how I begin to answer it. The first thing that I do is to totally rule out any dualism. No, there are not two of me. I will not settle for that. 
I will not settle for the fact that somehow or other I have to wear two hats, one for the weekend and one for the week, or one at the office or one at home. There's only me, just me. So this dualism, I reject completely. Other possibilities of people who try to reconcile their, uh, their religious claims with, the, with this kind of critique, with their, science, with their love for science and respect for it, are discussed in the book under the title of the Monty Python Critique. And I would like to read to you part of that, if I may. It refers to the show, which, which by the way, they, they had it on the other day in, in one of the PBS things. Uh, you know, they're constantly asking for money, the all night long type thing. They, they, they did Monty Python at the Hollywood Bowl. Splendid. I almost sent them something. Do you recall the great Monty Python uh, sketch entitled Stake Your Claim? State Your Claim. In this sketch, a contestant makes a claim and tries to defend it against critical questioning. The first contestant claims that he wrote all of Shakespeare's plays and that he and his wife wrote Shakespeare's sonnets. After making his claim, the host points out that Shakespeare's plays are known to have been performed in the early 17th century. The host then asks the contestant, how old are you? And the contestant responds that he is 43 years old. Naturally, the host wonders how he could have been, he could have written the plays that were performed more than 300 years before he was born. There is this great silence. And finally, the contestant admits, that's where my, my claim falls to the ground. That's the first possibility. The first contestant's claim is easily undermined and totally destroyed by the available historical evidence, uh, the text of Shakespeare's writings. In a similar way, religious claims that are based on hysterical, uh, historical events can appear difficult to sustain when subjected to historical criticism. Such criticism sometimes casts serious doubts of whether the events happen at all or as reported. The second contestant claims that he had built the Taj Mahal. But as soon as his turn came up to defend his claim, he simply withdrew from the game and refused any further debate. Similarly, some will not submit their religious convictions to a debate or to scientific criticism, feeling that it, fearing that it will invalidate their claim. Of course, historical investigations are not the only source of critique for religious claims. These claims may also come into conflict with the latest dominant scientific theories in biology, psychology, even cosmology concerning such uh, issues as the age and future of evolution of the universe, another extraordinary phenomena. As a result, some have attempted to separate their religious claims from their dependence on history and science for possible verification. They will say that religious convictions concern another dimension distinct totally from scientific knowledge and therefore not subject to empirical questioning, or that these convictions are wrapped in philosophical concepts totally beyond the scope of the scientific enterprise. The move to inoculate religion from scientific critique alters the terminology of the discussion so much that science has no way of responding to whatever claims religions had made, at least for the moment. In Monty Python's sketch, there is uh, Mrs. Mitch, or whatever her name is, I can't pronounce it. The third contest, uh, contestant had claimed in a letter that she could be thrown off the cliffs of Beachy Head into the English Channel 
and be buried. But when the host asked her to repeat her claim, she said something entirely different. That is, she said she could burrow through an elephant. When the host confronted her about changing her claim, she insisted she simply couldn't read, that he simply could not read her handwriting. The host replied, your letter was typewritten. <laughs> In a similar way, when faced with the possibility that scientific criticism might invalidate their religious claim, some proceed to change it. They say that what they mean is something else altogether, inaccessible, unverifiable. The question is, does any religious claim today survive any criticism? Or should religious people steer clear of dialogue? In my own life, I have to reconcile my love for science and my religious convictions. Can human life be totally explained in entirely materialist terms? Does the traditional view of body, soul, mind, and thought matter and spirit hold any water today? How to understand it? Or should those of us who believe in the spiritual realm simply use one of the Monty Python's tactics? Can religious convictions survive the Monty Python critique? I believe they can. So these are all dangers to avoid in the path. Then, Positive, I propose the path to follow, the experience to follow, is what I will call the path of desire. The path of desire. I propose to you that human desires unimpeded, let go, if you don't stop them, will go way beyond what appears to be realistic or possible. And you ask yourself, what's happening? I think that desires indicate some kind of needs and point to something that can satisfy them. And you may arrive at the wrong thing, but there is at least something. Otherwise, how come you have the desire would be a meaningless, I mean, not meaningless, an irrational. So indeed, if I want to say that desire is not the path that continues forever, because I can't see anything that will fulfill what I want from uh, in a moment we'll go over some examples. If I cannot, if, if I cannot uh, say that, if I can say that the desire is something irrational, then I am prepared to undergo what follows, and that is to suppress my desires, to get rid of them. I don't want, if it is irrational, I want to, then it's a waste of time. But this is precisely what I cannot do. Desire is closely related to caring. Caring. A desire, caring. What's going on with these experiences? What do I care about anything? Implying that some things are important, others less important. According to what? What is the measure of importance? Where does it come from? I quote Singer in, the, in, the, in my book. He says that while until recently, after a certain age, there, there's the age factor, he described his view of reality, of the world, as inattentive world, unworldliness. <laughs> inattentive unworldliness. Now, older and wiser, he admits that he be, has become, has begun to care about the human condition. He is a teacher, and a teacher really is someone who cares. Because if you don't care, <laughs> the heck, why do anything? The teacher is motivated by hope. And so he tries to find out the origin of this caring, of this experience that he suddenly now has. 
And he says the origin is rationality. As the one shining reality in, in what is otherwise a disaster of the human condition. He wrote, he speaks of it as the marvelous and uniquely human virtue. Think of this. This man is using a word virtue. This is not scientific language. It is a straining beyond, an experience of, of a beyond. He speaks of his own passion. Passion, caring, hope, virtue. Where is this coming from? Professor Pollock here, then I read his stuff and then I discuss it. Following the path of insight and persistently looking at the experience of insights in science. It is awesome. He knows what I, that I agree with him. I, however, think there is related to insight too, something even earlier perhaps that led him to the path of insight, and that is the experience of caring, of suddenly feeling what he read, this, this sense of responsibility. And that is point zero. If you, there in the, in the book, I also uh, talk about no, I'll skip this. Well, yeah, but an interesting discussion of, between the philosopher Paul Ricoeur, a believer, and the scientist Jean Zhu about how we think, in which the proposal is that there is only one experience. We are not, we are not dualists. The, the experience of one that is there when you say I, one experience of your personal, if you wish, but two distinct ways narratives are necessary to account for its totality. It's a fascinating book. I recommend it for you. The point is, to anticipate where one arrives, <coughs> when you continue, you become to realize that what you are looking for is not linearly beyond. That is to say what one calls infinity or eternity, it's not just the endless continuation of the calendar life. What you are talking about, what you desire, has to do more with quality than with duration. In, in my profound book, I, you find this in the chapter called The Real Beer. You can see what I mean by vulgarization. The point is that what, my, what one wants to later will call the mystery of the young novel, I propose to you with that path, will show that it is not something to be added to reality, but something beyond that lies within, authors put it, in terms of what we call the mystery, what we call God, the object of religious experience, is the truth of what exists, of reality. So we are not talking. The origin of religion is not a vision of another world. It's not otherworldliness. It is something, I propose to you, to which you are led by being faithful to this world. It is attentive worldliness not inattentive on worldliness that leads to the path of encounter with the mystery. To sum it up, it's a question of being faithful to your experience, being critical and not stopping. The danger is the reduction of the intensity of the search or of the scope of the search. I think that there are many, many, many issues that will arise, but this 
the beginning has to be this. In my living of this amazement, about this experience, there's a, an experience I had, which I mentioned there. I was in Rome during the regime of John Paul II, and the Vatican Academy of Science was celebrating, I don't remember now, it was the birth of Einstein or the death or something like that. <laughs> Not celebrating it, the anniversary, okay. And the Pope had invited, had called, first of all, all the cardinals of the world, all of them, were in Rome for something else, obviously not for that. But it was indicated to them that they should go to that event. And, and they did. I tagged along, of course. Then there was also the, the entire diplomatic corps. I, it was as big as it gets, okay, in this awesome, totally awesome room in the Apostolic Palace. And there was the Pope in his splendor and everything. And there, the head of the Academy of Sciences, but especially the man who was being honored that night was Paul Dirac. If you know anything about quantum physics, for example, when you get a function named after you, you're big. <laughs> the Dirac function is beautiful. There is no other word. And there was the man. I mean, I had never seen this guy. I had long left my romantic relationship with physics. But it all came back. I'm telling you, I saw Dirac, and I, I with all the new apology, maybe because I already know the guy, I was just more fascinated looking to him than looking at the Pope. But so was the Pope. The Cardinals, of course, were sleeping. <laughs> and the, the, the diplomats were very uncomfortable. They had hard chairs. But not only was the award given, but Dirac presented a scientific paper. This was not a fair, how beautiful faith and science dancing along. There was a scientific paper on what he was working on, the project he was working on in physics. It was presented there. And we'll go into history as Paul Dirac's whatever the address was, the Vatican City. But the killer was when the Pope at the end spoke and said beautiful things. But at the end he said, I want everyone here to know that this was the room where Galileo was condemned. He didn't have to say any more. I mean, I still telling you this is something uh, that happened to me. The present Pope is running around talking about the broadening of reason and insisting again and again that the one contribution should be considered that faith or religious thinking can offer the world today is this confidence on reason. It is courage to continue the quest, not to be afraid of the notion of truth. Because if reason goes, if truth goes, there will never be a basis for that caring at a global scale to prevent disasters. I have to finish. The rest of the book deals with suffering, and that is a mystery. And the last part deals with concrete uh, subjects of sexuality, politics, economy, that kind of stuff, little things. Finally, I end with beyond religion. But that touches on faith and on things that, that are awesome, but before we get to them, we have to undertake this journey that begins with a simple experience, wonder. Only wonder matters. Thank you.
We have some time for questions and conversation. I wonder who will grab a microphone. If you have a question, please raise your hand and Gail will find you with a microphone. I'll begin uh, by a question that came to me on the very first thing you said. Uh, you said, no other way to grasp reality but reason. And I think you closed in a similar argument that when reason goes, things unravel. But I can think of two cases where the second thing you said takes precedence over reason. That is, the second thing being the necessity of seeing the other, engaging the other, being seen by the other. Uh, these two these two examples are at the beginning and end of life, the, the mental state of a newborn baby, exactly. and the mental state of your mother and my father in Alzheimer's dementia. In both cases, I think it's fair to say whatever there is of the human mind, there is not reason. But what there does re remain, in my experience, is the recognition of the other the happiness in the presence of the other. I remember visiting my father in a home, and he recognized me before I recognized him, yeah. and he was happy to see me. That happiness, I think, is a form of human communication connected oh. to the problem of faith, but not through reason. I am in full agreement. I don't know that I said it that way, but if I do, I'll change it a little bit. Reason for me is a method. And uh, the experience comes first. Reason is now a way of analyzing this in, to make conclusions, judgments about reality. I'm maintaining that that is all we have. What I call by reason is that we know of no other method, which in fact leads to the correspondence between need and what is out there. But yes, the point of the departure is the experience that I talked about of wonder, uh, recognition, uh, that was of otherness, that is the, absolutely the point of departure. So I, I want to not give the impression. For me, reason is a method at the survey, which when applied to what begins with this form of recognition, allows us to understand more and more until whatever. Um, I was wondering uh, how you would think about you know, my, my problem with faith all the time has been its political nature in America. And when you talk about, you know, the wonderment and the attentive worldliness, I think it was a comment you made, I think about the kind of thing we've experienced as Americans for the past 40 years mm -hmm. with born-again fundamentalism uh, having a pernicious effect on our society. And we have been faced with constant debates about abortion, about uh, uh, creationism, uh, ideas justifying almost Calvinistic ideas, justifying social inequality in our country, which to me, as someone who is an agnostic, uh, you know, I just find it very difficult to deal with the aspects of faith that have been uh, put upon us uh, in, in reality. We, we, people have used faith to justify these right. kind of things. I wonder how you, you, know, you how, how sure. you think about that. This is marvelously explained <laughs> in my presentation, <laughs> Faith and Politics, that is another gig that he got for me here at the university, we just finished last Wednesday, and then it will come out, obviously, in book form. But look, uh, my, yeah, I understand what you're talking about. Now, it presupposes what to do about it. I mean, you can do a number of things. You can continue, each side can continue fighting each other and intend to impose their views on everybody else. And I would hope we, that would never, we, we would never allow that to happen. Presumably, our, our structure as a society, our constitution, our dedication to freedom, etc., all uh, will uh, prevent this from happening. One would hope so, otherwise we're in serious danger. But does it mean that each side has to, con has, to pre has to withhold within itself? I mean, what I'm trying to say is that I think the path to do this, okay. 
while that okay so now I don't mind saying okay because it's not okay because it's not okay yes <laughs> no what I'm trying to say is okay <laughs> come on look I need some voodoo or something like that, some religious experience. Oh. In the presentation on faith and politics, I went, I used as an example the discussion between jo Joey Ratzinger, who now is a pope, and, and Jürgen Habermas and, and a German atheist. Uh, and what has brought them together? What has brought them together is the concern that at the present time, we don't have any common basis of agreement that might allow us to, to direct, guide, or even tame the powers that have been unleashed in this world, by, uh, at the, at a, mostly by science and technology. This is a, a concern. You see, it begins with caring, with a concern. So. Uh, here is the man who, the, in a year later, was going to be Pope, uh, speaking about this with a leading, uh, a, a leading German philosopher, uh, absolutely a man of radical secularism. He doesn't believe in the electric light, as we say in Puerto Rico. <laughs> no creen en la luz eléctrica. Anyway, <laughs> and stays like that. And the Pope, I am happy to inform you of those who get stays as a believer. They're not convincing each other. What they are doing is trying to find a ground upon which to hold a dialogue. Okay. And, uh, and what I am, this is what I am proposing. I mean, I know the situation, but if we want to do something about it, either we defend our position by whatever way one wants, each side will do it and try to impose it on the other, or that is totally rejected, or you, you, you are overwhelmed, you, are, you, are, you, you collapse, uh, drown in a sea of political correctness in which you cannot even really talk about anything. Or we look for a ground in which we can deal realistically and responsibly to what is going on. The question is, upon what is that based? You say, what kind of the ground can there be? And this book... Uh, that has been uh, print, uh, published with, about Ratzinger and Habermas, the, the, the debate, it arrives at, a, at, a, at a, the beginning of an understanding of what grounds. In fact, they talk about, propose to look at the experience, and this is what's very good about the book, it does look at the experience, examine your own humanity, at the experience of, of human rights. Both sides want to affirm it, and why one would have want to affirm it uh, is the next question, which reflects a meeting that occurred between Ratzinger and uh, an Italian atheist. Uh, it was uh, published and many times, and many people went. I mean, it's, why don't we have such things? Anyway, we have Hitchkins and me at the Pierre Hotel. Anyway, uh, but I didn't say a thing. And in which, at one point, the discussion of you arrives at human rights, and, uh, and Cardinal Ratzinger asks this man, I want you to tell me only one thing. Are there such things as human rights, or are all rights civil rights? That is to say, granted by an authority, for whatever reasons, for however long, or are there human rights, rights that, per, that one can appeal to because one is human? Well, the other man was very consistent, and he said, there are no such things as human rights. They are all civil rights. Like, if that's what you want to hear, take it. And Ratzinger says, fine, we can't go any further. I have had an experience as a German of where that thinking leads to. And that ended that discussion. Well, one more question. You spoke of the known, the unknown. I didn't. I'm lying. Oh, I'm just, you were quoted just in case I was book. defending myself like this show. <laughs> you were quoted from the book with uh, known, unknown, and unknowable. Um, that's, uh, that's his invention. I learned it from him. If there's, <laughs> if there's anything wrong in there, it's his fault. 
Tell me. I don't know that there's anything wrong in oh, it well at all. Oh, well, then, fine. I did say that, yes. Uh, uh, you also said that uh, not only is the rational important, but the experience tends to precede the rational. So my question is, do you have an experience of the unknowable? Splendid. <laughs> Splendid question. Only that belongs to the end of the book. Because now, now you're dealing with a hot potato, yes. Uh, I, <laughs> this is where the chickens are separated from something else, I don't know. What would I answer? If I have, I would say yes. I have an experience of the point of intersection between the unknowable and the known unknown world. Not of the, of the unknowable, because I don't even know what that means. Okay, I mean, an experience of the unknowable, <laughs> I have it every day, I don't know a damn thing, you know. Beyond that, the unknowable, what does it mean? What does the word mean? Can, can I have an experience? I, I don't even know what the possibility is. What I do have an experience, it's of like what I'm calling like a point of intersection. In this case, insight, for example, or this caring, or this discovery of the other, of this responsibility for the other, is that point to something whose origin is beyond what is known and unknown. It's by its nature unknowable. You can discern it that way. So I would say not a direct experience, but yes, an experience through... Uh, signs, as I tried to, to say. Now, the ultimate question, the really last one, the biggie where you veil your face, is whether the young novel can do something about it. It is the question of revelation. Can the young novel reveal something otherwise unknowable? Ah, oh, well, that's another book. <laughs> Perhaps another trip to the Ritz-Carlton. <laughs> okay. Thank you.